Our next mar uh, market that we're involved in is what we call the mid-tier ERP software market. And that's the product that we've been very successful in Kenya with, to such an extent that we opened an office here about 18 months ago. It's called Sage Pastel Evolution. We're very proud that as an ERP software vendor, it's quick to deploy, the total cost of ownership is very reasonable, and at least you don't have to have much business disruption when you employ the software. You can see that it has financials, distribution, manufacturing, business intelligence, CRM, serial number, job costing, point of sale, and a host of other modules which can really verticalize your business as you need that kind of technology. It was launched in 2003 and we have 6,000 active users today. And it's a, it's a major growth area of our business. And then our internet software, which is kind of aimed at the SME business that you run through your browser with all your data stored on a server farm and it's proper web-based software where you don't have to store your data locally. It gives you ease of use with being wherever you want to be to run it. Your accountant can log in from their office and you can all work concurrently. So that's kind of the next generation of technology which is coming through the world. And it's great that Pestle is positioned in both ends of the market. Our story. The business was founded with three partners in 1990 and two employees. We did the support, manufacture, and distribution of our accounting software. So we have programmers actually writing our software, testing it. We have people writing manuals. And we reach our target audience through resellers and selling the product in retail. With our ERP software, we also work through higher level resellers, uh, kind of more skilled than those in the SME market. We sold out the business to a major listed IT company in 1994. We then did a management buyout and bought the business back from the people we sold it to. I am proud to say that the profits were about five times higher than when we sold it. But the reason that we bought it back is that we saw potential to list it on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, which we did in 1997, when there was that whole dot-com boom. There was then a hostile bid for the company off the Stock Exchange in 2003, and uh, we flew to London and we spoke to Sage, who's a top 100 company on the London Stock Exchange, and they bought us 100%, and then we were delisted from the Stock Exchange. Today, we're part of Sage, which is a global business with over 6 million users, and they employ about 8,000 people internationally. So I thought what would be relevant is to try and talk to you with kind of the struggles that you've got in, in your business, relating it to what we had. So in the beginning, we did everything. As I said, three founders, two employees, and everybody gets involved in doing everybody's work. The business is too small to have really separation of, of duties, et cetera. When we were growing, we were very anxious about what is the next move because you're asking yourself, how do you grow? Should you take on staff? My overheads are going to go up. And it's a very difficult time in the business because you kind of have to trust yourself that we've got to employ good people and then the turnover will come and then we can grow and it's a hard time in the business and there's no answer to that. You have to believe your own gut instinct. We had working capital and finance issues in the beginning. We had systems issues because although we were accounting software vendors, we were so busy trying to sell the product that I think we didn't really take care of our numbers. There were more stakeholders as we grew because all of a sudden you got more employees, suppliers are more important, the banks get involved, and you have to end up like being answerable to a lot of more people than you were when you just started. And then also exposure to the market, being bigger, being more in the public eye, has its issues. You have more competitors on your doorstep because you're much more visible. The public awareness, so if you do something wrong, you've got to be quite careful because all of a sudden when you list it, your competitors could put something in the press or on the internet and it affects you much more than where you, when you were a smaller business. And obviously your working capital issues. So what mistakes did we make in the beginning? Hiring good people. I think in the beginning we were trying to be too penny wise and pound foolish. So we kind of got people that we could pay less and they weren't great and that held us back. Accounting systems. We were too busy 
to analyze and think about the numbers. You know, you have your accounting system, they're going to generate your trial balance, income statement, and balance sheet, but you need headspace to look at those numbers and help you understand the business and drive it forward. The culture of the business. We weren't really aware of what the culture of the business was. And the way I've come to understand it 20 years later is that you should treat your business like a, let's say, a circle with a gate at the top. And the only people you let come through those gates into your business are people with the right culture and the right attitude. You cannot afford to let anybody w walk through the gate into your business who doesn't fit your culture or your ethic because they take up so much headspace doing the wrong thing, wrong culture, and then it takes up management time to try and get them out and undo what they haven't done right. A big part of business is also learning to say no easily. Very often when you're trying to grow, you're saying yes to every person who comes to present a deal to you, especially these strategic alliances. So what starts to happen is that you have meetings after meetings after meetings, your stomach's telling you this isn't the right thing, but it wasn't easy to say no. And I think that if you can say no to the right people who's going to just take up your management time, it's going to become easier to say yes, which is also very important when the right uh, situation presents itself, the right opportunity presents itself to you. And I can just look back at our career, and it still happens today, where you say yes to certain people who come to your business, we've got a great idea, you kind of feel sorry for them, okay, we'll go for it, and then after the sixth meeting, you can see it's not working, and all you've done is you wasted time. Don't lose focus. Always remember what your core competency is and stick to that. Once it's got momentum and you've got the right people driving it, you can afford to start branching out. But don't do that too early on. I've seen so many businesses always want to move to the next level without really taking care of the core in the beginning. Don't let anxiety strangle your business. I think you've got to become very self-aware of your own emotional state. Because very often, talking for myself, in the beginning, I wouldn't allow people to do things because I wasn't aware of what was making me scared. But I think once I kind of understood that, it would free me up to really mentor the people around me and let them take chances. It's like playing cricket. If you're going to try and hit a six every time, sometimes you've got to get caught out. But if you're going to force everyone to block all the time, you're never really going to go anywhere. So sometimes you've got to just be freer in the way you run the business. Debt versus equity. Don't be scared of debt. And when you issue equity, make sure you're doing it for the right reason. Because remember, when you're issuing equity, it can be very expensive in the long run if you're issuing it too cheaply. So like when you list on the stock exchange, make sure that the multiple you're listing on is a fair multiple so that you're not going to regret it in 10 years' time that you sold half the company to get some money in and then it actually really affects your financial state. If you can afford to take on debt and you've worked out your numbers, never forget that once you've paid back that debt, you still own 100% of the company. And once again, this comes down to understanding your numbers properly, understanding what your return on equity is, your return on investment, so that you can see whether the debt is too expensive. Keep employees in the loop. Make them feel part of the business the whole time. I'll come to this later on why it's so important. I've discussed emotional intelligence. Put the right people in the right job. Often, we've had great people working for us, and you put them in another position and they fail. And because you don't want to accept your own um, criticism, you'll blame those people. But in the meantime, it was your fault that you put that person in the wrong job. And it's also very difficult that sometimes you will have people in your business who say, we want to grow, we want to go to the next level. You also sometimes have to say to them, it's not the right position for you, and don't take this hard, but I've looked at your skill, and until you grow, you can't move. And if they leave you, it's too bad. But sometimes don't give in because you just want to keep that person, and now you put them in the wrong position. It's always going to come back to bite you, and they'll end up blaming your company. Think big, but keep your feet on the ground. When we listed and I was flying overseas to meet the big investment houses like Morgan Stanley and Merrill Lynch, I kind of got lost in my own self-importance. And I think today, where we're doing much better than we were in those days, 
I've never forgotten where I've come from now. And I think the people who work with me would see that I'm actually one of them. And then uh, a point I skipped, hire for attitude. I would far rather take a person who hasn't been to university and has a great attitude than somebody who has all the academic qualifications but doesn't have the right attitude. Because people with the right attitude can learn, you can teach them, they'll grow with your business. So what are we doing right now? We sell our value proposition confidently. When we go into a business, we know our product's good. You've got to be confident about it. You've got to be confident in the price that you're charging. If you come across and say, I'm going to charge you $20,000 for the system, but you're feeling bad about it, it's going to come through to the customer. You must be proud of what you do, and therefore you're proud to charge what you charge. But you've got to back that up with good product and good service. But never ever go into a negotiation where you're not sure about the quality of your people and the quality of your product. The information systems, your accounting system, must be used to help you understand the business, not only to balance the books. Plans are a waste of time, but planning is essential. The whole process of planning is very important because you've got to sit down, you've got to understand your business. Once the plan's done, you have to be flexible and not say we can't afford to spend this kind of money on marketing because it wasn't in the budget. You must be able to move as the, the, the actual landscape's moving. So I'm saying plan because you've got to understand the business. Once the plan's done, don't be too fixed on it. Don't get distracted by the small stuff. Important versus urgent. Don't take your eye off the ball by concentrating only on the urgent stuff. What sometimes we very often get lost in, and I'm talking to myself because I've made all these kind of errors. You go in in the morning and you attend to all those little urgent things, you know, maybe paying traffic fines. Doing, meantime, the longer term stuff, you're not really concentrating on because it's harder to formulate a strategy. So you rather preoccupy yourself with all these little unimportant, urgent matters. That comes out of that Stephen Covey book. Lead by example. We're a business that uh, does about, what is it, times seven. We do 50 million US dollars a year, just our division. And we probably make profits of about, call it 15 million dollars a year. But yet my office is, if you walked into our offices, Daryl, Nikki, we all sit in the open plan area with the rest of the people. And I find that that engenders a spirit of where people know that you're one of them. I think that that's very important in our culture. Know your weaknesses and don't be embarrassed by them. I think that's critical. If you know your weaknesses, you will employ somebody to take care of that weakness instead of you defending a, a, it the whole time and actually failing at what you do. For instance, me. I'm a decent inspirer of people, but I'm pathetic on detail. And I know I'm pathetic on detail. So, therefore, the people employed in the business who will, I'll start things, they'll finish them off. And I think that that's important so that you don't frustrate the rest of the business around you. Uh, make your employees love coming to work. This is probably one of the hardest, uh, the hardest objectives. But the way you can get to that goal is give them responsibility, allow them to make considered mistakes. Don't punish them for the mistakes they made. As long as you know that they tried their best, they used the information at hand to go for it. But if they make a mistake, if you're going to punish them, then all you're going to have in your business at the end of the day are yes people who are too scared to make a mistake. But then you might as well hire robots. I want people in our business for their minds. And therefore, if you want them to express their opinions, you can't shout them down every time. Keep them informed. Also critical, everybody in our business knows what's going on. We sit down once a month, we go through the turnover, the profits, who we hired, who left, so everybody in the business feels that they're part of a living organism. And not only people who just work for you and don't know what's going on. Educate them, generally and within the industry. What we try and do at Pastel as well is that we talk about world stuff plus what's going on in the industry. So at least the people grow their horizons and recognize good work for, pe that were for people who go the extra mile. People are human beings. They all want to be recognized for good stuff. Don't ever forget this point. They're also insecure. They want to know that they've achieved and been recognized. The road ahead 
invest and spend for sustainability. This often takes guts. Rather, your business has to outlive you. You need to understand that. And to do that, you're going to have to spend today for what's going to happen tomorrow. Employees don't work for you. Rather, they work with you. And you all work for the business. That's a critical culture in our business. The employees that work for me don't work for me. We all work together for Pastel. And when I do something stupid, I'm very aware that this living organism of Pastel is looking at me. And I think that's very important. If your employees feel that you're working for them, actually, they're going to work harder for you. Always understand your competitors. Always understand where your industry, industry is going. And the only way you're going to do that is by reading and keeping aware of what's going on. Make your own opinions and draw your own conclusions. Don't believe everybody what they tell you. You've got to educate yourself. And if you disagree with what you read, be confident to make your own call. You've got to understand that in life, my, my experience is that most of everything that you hear is actually just somebody else's opinion. It's not the truth, it's their truth. And you need to educate yourself enough where you read all these opinions to make your own informed opinion. So don't read stuff and think that that is the way it is. All these management books that you see coming out of America, remember half of this stuff was just created so that other people could make money out of their ideas. Your ideas are as important, but only once they are informed ideas. Never ever make conclusions or draw your own ideas from a state of ignorance. That I don't believe in. Um, Look after your customers. Credibility of word of mouth is invaluable. You will never, ever get finer advertising than coming from a customer of yours telling somebody else because they know that they don't have a vested interest. So if you can get your customers to sing your praises, you know that you're on a winning wicket. And the only way you're going to do that is by looking after your customer and getting personal with them. Don't just sell to them and disappear. You've got to phone them. We, with our biggest customers, we try and phone them once a week. How's it going? Is everything okay? The last thing I want to hear is a year down the line that someone was upset with us and they left us. So rather be proactive. And what I've seen more and more again is that customers that are upset with us, you actually have the opportunity with their heart and emotion to turn them into friends. Because already you've got their emotions going, they're upset with you. And then once you deliver to them and, they show, and you, you show them that you're prepared to go the extra mile, they can actually become your biggest friends. Something that I struggle with big time is procrastination is the enemy of progress within your business. Make a decision and move on. Too often I find us procrastinating about difficult decisions. And even if it's little pieces of information that you're sitting on, often I'll see my inbox of emails start filling up. And whenever I look at those emails, there's something slightly uncomfortable about them. And that's what makes me procrastinate. And what ends up happening is that you frustrate everybody in your business, that you're not like, kind of taking the lid off the bottle and letting the liquid flow out. And then once again, it's just to recognize that you procrastinate with stuff that you're uncomfortable about. So a typical thing would be where my gut instinct hasn't told me that I'm sure to do something. So then somebody's emailing me for a decision, and then I end up just staying away. And you've got this thing called recall time. When you come back to it in two weeks' time, it's a much bigger issue. And then you've got to go through it again and familiarize yourself. Try and deal with these things there and then. Clean your inbox. Don't clutter your mind that you go home and it's in your subconscious. All these unanswered emails and stuff that you're procrastinating on. They can be little pieces of paper on your desk, but if you leave them for three weeks, they actually become mountains of emotional clutter in your head. It happens to me all the time. Something else I've had to learn, and I still haven't got it done. I know that Darren and Nikki are laughing. Keep your promises and get back to people. When you tell somebody that you're going to do something, do it. Because once again, these are things that fill up your subconscious and don't allow you to think freely and feel free about expressing your opinion. The whole time it's on your head. You haven't got back to this person. Never mind the fact that your reputation suffering. I think it actually affects your own mood and the way you act in your business when you're carrying around all that baggage that you haven't delivered promises to people. The road ahead. Don't be defensive. I very often find that in businesses, 
when one of your employees criticize you or you criticize them, they become very, uh, very defensive and they shut down. Now, that does two things. First of all, if you're defensive, you're not going to learn. If you're going to protect yourself the whole time and say, I'm not wrong, it's your fault, you're never going to learn. And I've got bad news for all of you. None of you in this audience are perfect. And I'm the living personification of that. But you've got to listen to what other people say. That's the first point. If you're defensive and you're angry in the, your response, they're never going to talk to you again about the issues. So then what you get is information gridlock in your business. People, I mean, how's a business going to get better? That you give constructive criticism and people learn from you. But if you're going to be defensive and shut them down, they're not going to talk. And then it destroys the whole mood in the office and you're not going to get the best out of people. And I think this is one of the biggest things that I've struggled with in my business life is to see people who are not well thought out. They become very defensive when you criticize them. Obviously, your responsibility is to criticize them in a positive way. Remember, they're carrying baggage for the last 30 years of how their parents treated them. And if you hook into that, then they're just going to, you know, shut down and the whole thing becomes a nightmare. Keep your mind clear by taking care of the necessities, admin and systems. When your admin is bad, everything suffers, and time is spent tidying up non-critical areas of the business. I've said it time and time again, admin is a given. The fact that your books and records of your business need to be clean, that should be a given today. 20 years ago, you could be a hero if you said, I can do my audit in two days, everything's so good. Today, that has to be a given. You cannot afford to run your businesses with messy information. So please, and, and that type of stuff, admin, it's like your personal admin at home. If you spend 15 minutes a day, it's a non-issue. If you leave it for the end of the month, it becomes such a big issue that then you then leave it for another month. And it just all snowballs. So it's like air. You take it for granted, but without it, you're going to suffocate. Give back to the community. I made that point on the stage. I really think it changes your persona. And you don't have to only give back in money. You can give back in mentoring people. We try and do a lot of those programs at Soft Life, where you take people under your wing and you try and teach them because they're going to tell their friends and their friends will tell their friends. And in that way, you spread positivity in the environment. Get to the sweet spot quickly and always be relevant. I think one of my skills, and my staff will attest, attest to that, is that I can get to the sweet spot quickly. So in all the noise of information, You've got to try and just take out what's important. And what I find these days is most meetings that take an hour could have taken 15 minutes. Now, be aware of that. If you're going to take an hour because you just want to get along with a client and have a great rapport, that's fine. But very often, the information part of that meeting can get done in 15 minutes. And that's why I wrote, don't complicate the easy stuff to make yourself feel important. So often, meetings start... And the head of the meeting wants to feel important and they go on and on and you've got to listen to them. Don't get lost in your ego. Be cool with who you are. Make your point clearly and get on with the meeting. Keep your eye on strategic issues, but without execution, strategy is meaningless. Okay? If you're going to have strategies, make sure that you execute on them. And if you can't do that, then have less strategies because... Somebody told me that uh, execution without, uh, sorry, vision without execution is hallucination. So think about that. And then my last comment, which I think is very pertinent to this country, and I read the quote last week. Apparently it was by Abraham Lincoln. Nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to really test a man's character, give him power. And if you think about our continent, I think that about says it all. Thank you very much.